In this episode, I'm going to talk about what I think is missing from the tourism industry. What's up, y'all? This is the Life in English podcast. I'm your host, Tony Kaizen. And like I said in the intro, we're going to be talking about traveling, hotels, the tourism industry in general, and what I think is missing. But before I get started, if you are just listening to this podcast on my website or Spotify or some other podcast platform, you can watch the podcast now on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash life in English. And if you are watching this podcast, what's up? All right. Now we're not going to waste any time. We're going to get right into the topic of this episode, which is the tourism industry and what's missing. Now, if you're learning a foreign language, you probably love the idea of traveling across the world to have unique experiences and learn more about different cultures and ways of life. And I think it's something that we can all relate to. So that's why I'm going to be talking about tourism today. And the one thing that I think would make the industry better would provide a lot more value to travelers around the world and also make a lot more businesses, a lot more money. But before I get into what I think is missing, what I think would make the industry better, let's just talk about the industry in general. So you'll have the vocabulary you need in order to follow me for the rest of this episode. So when we think about the tourism industry, we think of things like accommodation, transportation, and guided trips around a particular city, right? And there are different types of accommodation. You have traditional hotels, like in the U.S., maybe the Holiday Inn or the Wyndham or the Hilton or there's a bunch. There's a bunch of traditional, typical hotels. And then you also have hostels, which is, you know, kind of like a hotel, but it's much smaller generally. And it's much more of a familiar environment. And it's typically, at least in my experience, made for the budget travelers who are focused on, let's say, saving money and having more experiences inside and outside of the hotel. So in a hostel, you might not get your own private room. You might be in a room with four to eight or even 12 people sometimes, and there's a bunch of bunk beds all in one room, and all you get is a bed, and you're sharing it with a bunch of strangers, essentially. And a lot of times, a hostel will be like a, a good-sized house that was converted into a hotel. So let's say a three- or four-bedroom house, and they just turned each room into a hotel room, there might be two or three bathrooms, there's a kitchen and a living room and stuff like that, you know. And then after hotels and hostels, we have Airbnb. Now, this platform has become really popular over the years, and it's actually one of my favorite options because it's kind of like it's the perfect mixture between feeling at home and also being in a hotel. So you might travel to some foreign country, and instead of paying some expensive price for a hotel or paying a cheap price but having to share a room and a bathroom and a house with a bunch of strangers, you might be able to rent your own bedroom in somebody's house through Airbnb or rent an entire house or apartment through Airbnb, right? And then you have things like luxury resorts. Um, I don't know the names of any off the top of my head, but a resort is like those luxurious hotels on some, you know, some gorgeous beach with crystal blue water and you get all the food you can eat, all the alcohol you can drink. It's very, very, very expensive luxury, let's say, quote unquote, high class hotels. That's what we call a resort. <clears throat> and then you have an option which we call couch surfing. Now, it's funny because this platform has been around most likely over a decade now. And there's still people today who have never heard of this. Unfortunately, the platform isn't what it used to be. I wouldn't recommend this option to most people these days. But just in case you're wondering, couch surfing is it's kind of like Airbnb, but you don't pay for it. And because of that, you might not get the highest quality experience in terms of accommodation. You might stay with some great people, have a great experience, but in accommodation, it's not always the best. So the way it works is basically you get on the couch surfing uh website or platform and you can say i'm going to stay in los angeles so there's a bunch of people in los angeles that are willing to let travelers and other people from other places stay at their home and either sleep on the couch or if you're lucky you get your own bedroom or something like that and it's totally free you, they don't really expect anything in return most of the time you know so that's the basic idea of couch surfing you're literally surfing not literally surfing but figuratively surfing from couch to couch to couch as you travel. And the idea is that, you know, it's just travelers helping travelers. We don't have to exchange money or anything. We can just exchange experiences. I can help you. And then I get to meet people from all over the world. 
Like I remember when I was in college, um, I had some girls from Croatia stay at my place, a dude from Belgium. He was really cool. Um, so I've had experience with couch surfing and it was cool in the past. You know, I just heard a lot of stories recently that it, it's not as cool as it used to be. And a lot of people are kind of on that platform for the wrong reasons, but I can't generalize. So now you know that it exists. If you want to check it out and give it a try, there you go. And the last option, you know, I guess, no, not, not, I guess it is a form of accommodation, which is like your friend or your family's house. You know, you might travel to another country or just another state or city. You can stay with some friends and family. That's still accommodation. All right. And next we have transportation. So accommodation is basically where you're going to sleep, where you're going to stay. Transportation is how you're going to get to and from the places you're going to sleep and stay. So the first one is just an airplane or a plane for short. Some people say airplane. Most of us just say plane. All right. The next one is a bus. Then you have trolleys and trams. And just in case you don't know what a trolley or a tram is, it's like um, if you've ever seen a movie or a TV show or even pictures of San Francisco, you might have noticed that in the streets, there's a little train. It's not your traditional train like on train tracks or even a subway that goes underground or nothing like that. It's a slow moving cart on a metal track that goes throughout the city. And we call that a trolley or a tram or a streetcar. To me, it's really all the same thing. And you also see them. I remember when I was in New Orleans, I saw trolleys in the city. I know they're in San Francisco. I don't know about other cities in the U.S. But anyway, trolley, tram, streetcar, to me, it's all the same. And then you have things like cabs or taxis. And that's the same thing as well. A cab or a taxi, the yellow cars that uh, maybe you go to the airport and you'll see a bunch of them lined up just waiting to overcharge you to take you somewhere that you need to go. And then what disrupted the taxi industry is something called Uber. I'm sure you've heard of it, and I'm sure there's many variations of the same company um, or the same service in other countries. They just have different names, right? And then you have a bicycle, which is a very good way to get around the city. Not sure it's the best way to get from city to city, though. Although I'm sure people do it. I just, you know. But if you're in the city, a bike is an awesome thing to have. But I will say, um, not the safest, right? Especially if you're riding through the city like New York or L.A. or something like that. You got to keep your head on the swivel. And what that means is basically you got to be looking around. Because to swivel, like if you're watching this, it'll make much more sense. If you're watching on YouTube, to swivel basically means like you have this one piece. And it it doesn't change locations, but it swings from left to right. So I can swivel this way and then I swivel that way, you know. Probably not the best explanation, but at least if you're watching, you can see what I mean when I say keep my head on the swivel. You got to constantly be looking around, paying attention, being aware of your surroundings. But anyway, let's keep uh, moving forward. The next form of transportation might be a ferry or a boat. And I don't mean ferry like fairy godmother or something like that. It's F-E-R-R-Y, ferry, which is just a type of boat. I don't really know what makes a ferry a ferry, but just understand it's a type of boat. All right. And the last one is the train. A train, technically, a train is above ground and a subway is underground. But you can say train, you can say metro, you can say subway in the city. And it's really all the same. There's technical differences, but we use all three words interchangeably. All right. Now, as far as guided tours go, they typically consist of walking tours or bike tours around the city or maybe some type of excursion through a net like a naturistic place or some natural place like the mountains or some forest or some caves or something like that or you can even do stuff like extreme sports like skydiving or bungee jumping which is just not for me like skydiving i think i'm i would be open to trying that but the bungee jumping and just in case you don't maybe they call it something completely different in your language bungee jumping is when you go up to like a really tall bridge or a building or something like that and they tie this this bungee cord, this really stretchy long cord or rope around your ankle, and then you just jump off. And the idea is that you're falling down and the cord is stretchy, so at some point it's going to stretch as far as it can, and then the the elasticity of the cord will bring you back up. That's the idea. You won't actually hit the ground. But I just can't imagine like taking that risk. I know, I, I don't know, I just imagine... That like the death rate 
and that type of stuff, the accident rate on that type of activity is relatively low. Otherwise, I don't think they would keep doing it so much. But I'm just, nah, I'm good. No thanks, you know? But anyway, those are the typical type of tours or activities you can do when you're traveling um, to different cities, states, or countries, or whatever, right? Now, what's interesting and unfortunate about the traveling industry in general is most of our money goes to accommodation and transportation. Like, I would imagine 50, 60 percent, maybe more of the money that we spend is just on a place to sleep and how we get to that place, right? Plane uh, tickets, train tickets, Uber fees, hotel rooms, stuff like that. Now, on one hand, it's it's okay when you look at it from a certain perspective because it stimulates the economy, right? That's a good thing. But on the other hand, I think a lot more of us would be able to travel on a regular basis if we didn't have to spend so much money on these things. And this is one of the reasons I prefer to travel slowly over long periods of time. Because not only do I get more time to explore a particular place and its culture, but I also spend less money on transportation and accommodation because I don't have to buy as many plane tickets or train tickets or bus tickets. And there are usually discounts when you rent a room or an apartment for more than three weeks at a time. And when you travel quickly, when I say quickly, I just mean like a, you know, just a few days in a particular place and then you have to leave. You spend so much more money and you have a lot less time to experience what it's really like to live in a particular place. Another thing I find interesting is that most people who live in giant countries like, you know, the United States or Brazil or China, Argentina, or Russia, I mean, like big countries like this, is most people will never travel like around their own countries or inside their own countries. Like the U.S., for example, we have 50 unique states with a bunch of different landscapes, cultures, food and climates. I mean, it's just. There's such a huge variation of people, places, foods, and things to do in this country. But many Americans never leave their hometowns. And your hometown is the place that you were born and you grew up. That's your hometown. And the crazy thing about it is most people have no desire to visit other regions of the country or visit other countries. They're completely fine just staying in their city their entire life. Right? I'm not obviously I'm not saying anything is wrong with that. It's just to me, that's curious because I could never imagine staying in one city my entire life. You know what I mean? And I don't know if it's because of like my own history, because um, like I said before, I've lived in like 13 different cities or something like that. I mean, as a kid, we were always moving every two or three years and I kind of just got used to that. And then once I got the chance to travel and I fell in love with it, it's like, man, how could you not? Take every chance you got to go visit some new place, even in your own country. Just go visit some other place that's nothing like yours or just far away from everything that you know, you know. But anyway, getting to the point of the episode now, hopefully you're still with me. I have a friend in Mexico who has this dream of opening a hotel slash restaurant, meaning a hotel and a restaurant in the same building owned by the same company, operated by the same company. I don't know about you, but I've never heard of anything like that before. And from a tourist perspective, it's really the best of both worlds. When I say the best of both worlds, I mean, you know, the it's kind of self-explanatory, no? The best of both worlds is like you have the best thing about hotels and the best thing about restaurants. You put them both in one place, you get the best of both worlds, the best of two alternatives or two options. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, of course, there are hotels that have... Things like a continental breakfast every morning. Why they call it a continental breakfast, I don't know. But at least here in the United States, it's really common for some big hotel chains. When you wake up in the morning from, let's say, I don't know, 6 in the morning to maybe 10 in the morning, they just offer complimentary breakfast. You can just walk down to a particular area, get eggs and bacon, orange juice, toast and coffee and stuff like that. That's a continental breakfast. And there are also hotels that have, um, not hotels, there are also hostels that have kitchens, right? But I've never seen or heard of a legitimate restaurant that was also a real hotel. Never seen that before. And I guess, well, I guess the closest thing to that would be either a hostel or an Airbnb, kind of, or maybe like a casino. I don't know if casinos 
functions as hotels, but in a casino, like like in Las Vegas, for example, maybe you have the casino, you have hotel rooms upstairs, and you can also get something to eat. So yeah, I guess I guess they do exist in the form of a casino. Now that I think about it, but anyway, getting back to the point in my notes here, even an Airbnb is lacking many things that would create a well-rounded, authentic experience for a tourist visiting a foreign country. Airbnb, hostels, and casinos, I think they're all kind of lacking exactly that, which is that authentic, complete experience of what it means to be from that country, what it's actually like to live in that country. You know what I mean? Now, I was talking to my homegirl about her dream, and it really made me think about what's missing from the tourism industry right now, and that is authentic experiences. Of course, you can travel across the world to a foreign country and go to hotels and restaurants, and you can pay a tour guide that will show you the most popular buildings and statues in the city. And you can make conversation with people in the streets if you really want to. But the reality is most people tend to do the same things when they travel to another country. They pay for a hotel or an Airbnb. They search for tourist attractions online and they spend most of their time looking at statues and taking pictures in front of buildings and talking to cab drivers or waiters in restaurants. A lot of people spend all that time and money on a trip. And at the end of it all, all they can say is, I've been to that place. Now, the problem with traditional hotels is they have no soul, you know, Hotels are generally just big buildings with bedrooms in them. And you might be thinking to yourself, like, uh, duh, right? But just follow me for a second. Many of us spend ridiculous amounts of money for a hotel room when the only thing we're going to do in a hotel is sleep. Is a place to sleep really worth $75, $90, or even $120 per night? I don't think so. There's almost never anything interesting to do in the hotel. So if you're on vacation in a foreign country, you'll probably spend most of your time in the streets unless you're at a resort or something like that. But that's obviously not something most of us can afford or even want to experience, I think. Now, Airbnb is probably the closest thing to an authentic experience that you can get at the moment, right? Not only are they cheaper than hotels, but you're typically in someone else's house or apartment. You have a kitchen a living room, a TV, and sometimes even a laundry room. I remember when I was in Brazil, I was able to rent an entire apartment for half the price I would have paid to stay at a traditional hotel. And besides that, I was in a real neighborhood, not some commercial district that was made for tourists and busy professionals, you know? So every morning I could wake up and walk to the local bakery and make conversation with the people that worked there and the people that ate there. And I even saw my neighbors, quote unquote, on a regular basis. People thought I was Brazilian and they treated me as such. So what I got when I was there during my time, which was three months, during that time, what I got was what I thought of as a much more authentic and memorable experience without even having to leave my neighborhood. I genuinely felt like I was at home during my stay there, you know. But getting back to the point of an all-inclusive experience, the problem with Airbnb is that you'll probably be staying by yourself or in a house with just a few other people who might or might not be from that country. Now, I'm not saying you can't have an authentic experience that way. I'm just saying it's not ideal, at least to me. But what if, what if there were a place that could offer you the complete experience? People, food, music, events, language, and atmosphere, all in one place. Imagine if there were a hotel that was bigger than a hostel, but smaller than a traditional corporate hotel. Let's say enough for 50 people, something like that. Now, just for the sake of the example, and because my homegirl is Mexican, let's say the hotel is in Mexico City. So instead of a dull, you know, neutral group of boring hotel rooms, Each room would be decorated with like traditional Mexican colors and paintings from local Mexican artists and a radio playing with Mexican radio stations and podcasts and little Mexican candies for you to enjoy when you arrive. Not only is there a guidebook with cool things to see and to do in the city that only the locals know about, 
But there's also an itinerary with details about all the different events and tours the hotel is going to offer that week. The hotel has two living rooms where the guests can watch movies, listen to music, and make friends. And outside, there's a patio with a grill, maybe a small pool, and chairs where you can read your favorite book or just hang out, you know? And on the weekends, there's a small bar where you can buy Mexican tequila and mezcal, you know? Imagine if there were language exchange sessions at the hotel, like three nights a week for anyone who wanted to learn Spanish. Imagine if there were different tours you could take every day and visit places that only the locals know about. And on the weekends, the hotel hosted parties where you could meet other Mexican people, hear authentic Mexican music, learn to dance, make friends, and get as drunk as you want because you don't have to worry about how you're going to get home. You're already at the hotel, you know? And if you'd prefer to go out on the weekends, you know, the hotel owners would still be able to tell you about the best bars and clubs in the city. And not only that, but if you're hungry, you can walk right over to the restaurant side of the hotel and get an authentic Mexican meal every morning, afternoon and evening. No need to search on Google for the best restaurants. Just walk downstairs, you know. But if you wanted to try something different, the hotel owners can make recommendations for you. Because they're locals and they know everything about their city. They could tell you which places to stay away from, what's the best time to go somewhere, cultural practices when interacting with Mexican people, etc. I mean, what more could you ask for in a single building? You've got people, food, music, events, language, and atmosphere all in one place. That's a place that would create an authentic experience that you would remember for the rest of your life. I say that because it's happened to me before. I wasn't even in a foreign country. I remember I went on this road trip from Georgia to California, basically driving from the East Coast to the West Coast of the United States. The first place I stopped was New Orleans, Louisiana, a city that I highly recommend that you visit, by the way. I didn't know anything about the city at the time, All I knew was that I was going to be there for a week. I didn't want to pay a lot for a hotel, and I wanted to meet people while I was there. So I found a hostel with some good reviews online, and I booked a room. And when I got there, I was surprised to see that the hostel was essentially a big house. It had multiple bedrooms, a living room with comfortable couches, and a TV with Netflix, a stereo, cool decorations, and a kitchen where you could cook if you wanted to. It also had a small patio full of plants where you could read, you could smoke, or just enjoy the sun on a nice afternoon. (laughs) Now, on the weekend, the hostel hosted parties with good music and cheap drinks, and a lot of people that were staying at the hostel went to those parties and had a great time. The hostel also offered tours around the city and recommended places to visit that weren't like tourist traps. And it was within walking distance to the city, so it was far enough away from the chaos, but like, close enough for you to go and experience it if you wanted to, you know? And I remember I met this girl from London who was staying at the hostel, and we clicked instantly. We ended up exploring the city together for about 12 hours, and then we hung out around the hostel for 12 more hours, and we didn't sleep a single minute. Now, I know that's probably not something most people will experience when traveling, or even something I will experience again, but my point is that That's something that only a hotel with a familiar atmosphere can provide. Like-minded travelers who want to meet other people, have a good time, as opposed to just sitting in a hotel room and taking pictures of buildings, you know? Now, some of the best travel experiences I've ever had were at that hostel because of its atmosphere, the people I met there, and the places in the city they recommended I visit. And whenever I go back to New Orleans, I'll definitely be staying at that hostel. I'm certain my trip would not have been as good or as memorable if I hadn't stayed there. I still find myself thinking about that trip from time to time, you know. And that's the value and the benefit I see in creating a place that has the familiarity and atmosphere of a hostel with the organization and infrastructure of a hotel and a restaurant in one place. And you know I'm fascinated. Well, if you know me, you know I'm fascinated by the art of business. Right, so thinking about it from a businessman perspective, I think it would be pretty difficult to execute on this idea because there are just so many moving parts in this business, right? Like, think about it. 
you're essentially operating two separate businesses under one roof. So you'd have the actual hotel and the restaurant, which means you have startup costs for both, which is the money that you need to start the business to buy the building, you know, build the facilities, the kitchens, buy all the tables and chairs and beds and decorations and pay the employees and everything just to start the business, right? Then you have to pay and manage two sets of employees because theoretically half the people would work in the restaurant and the other half would work in the hotel. And then you have to manage the money from two separate businesses, from the income to the expenses to the taxes to just inventory, how much food do we need to buy every week and all that type of stuff. It's just a lot to manage in one place, you know. And then you have to plan and prepare for the weekend parties. You have to pay the locals to come give language classes or give them incentives to come to your parties so that your guests can meet real Mexican people and everybody can have a good time. Then you have the marketing for both businesses, both to the locals who can come visit your restaurant, but also all the foreigners who are visiting your city and online so people can feel a reason to come to your city and stay at your place. You know, so I see a lot of risk involved with trying to start a business like that, but I also see a lot of reward if you could actually pull it off, like if you can make it happen, you know. Now, of course, we already know that hostels exist. We know that hostels can offer many of the things that I just mentioned. But in my experience, hostels typically aren't managed as well as corporate hotels. And they also take more of a a hands-off approach to their guests. So you kind of have to make all the decisions about your trip by yourself. But I really believe that a hotel slash restaurant that could truly create an all-in-one cultural experience for its visitors would quickly gain popularity and it would always have people interested in staying there. Like I remember when I went to Sao Paulo, I was lucky enough to already have friends in the city and I spoke Portuguese well enough to survive by myself. So I had the opportunity to visit bars and clubs that only the locals knew about. I had a chance to visit neighborhoods that really wouldn't be safe for a foreigner to visit alone. And I was also invited into their homes to meet their families where we shared food, stories, laughter and created memories that will last for a lifetime. You know what I'm saying? And that's the type of thing you simply cannot buy. And it's the very reason that I love traveling like a local and not like a tourist. But it's hard for most people to have those kinds of of experiences. <clears throat> it's hard for people to have those kinds of experiences in a foreign country when they don't really know anyone and they don't speak the local language, right? And that's exactly why a hotel slash restaurant that could provide that experience would be so valuable to so many people. Local people could invite the guests into their homes or take them out to bars on a Friday night. The hotel could also make partnerships with other businesses in the area so that when guests were looking for new places to eat, the hotel could give them coupons for a restaurant up the street or the cafe around the corner. Excuse me. And if someone visited the cafe around the corner, the cafe owners could recommend the hotel slash restaurant as a great place to party and meet new people on a Friday night. And what this means is that instead of businesses competing with each other for tourists' attention and money, they'd be working together and everybody would win. You see what I'm saying? And when you stop and think about it, most people who get the privilege of traveling to another country will only have the chance to do it once in their lifetimes. That one experience that they have in that particular country can and probably will leave a lasting impression on them until they die. It's what they're going to tell their friends about. It's what they're going to tell their family about. It's what they're going to talk about on social media. And it's what's going to determine whether or not they have the desire to visit again and or recommend it to other people. My point is that many people will only have one chance to experience a country and its culture. I don't know if we're necessarily responsible for making sure the guests in our countries have a great experience I think that's debatable. But why not give them a positive experience that they'll remember for the rest of their lives? Why not give them an experience that makes them say, man, I love that country. I love those people. I hope I get to go back one day. Everybody wins in that scenario, right? The local businesses get more customers, which stimulates the economy. The tourists get a chance to feel like locals and experience the authentic way of life of that country. And those same tourists will take their experiences home with them and share them with everyone they know. 
This creates, this creates and deepens, yeah, it creates and deepens cultural understanding around the world. And then the cycle begins to repeat itself. You see what I'm saying? Now, the opposite is also true. If visitors in our countries have a poor or extremely generic experience, that's what they're going to remember. That's what they're going to tell everyone about. So instead of saying, man, that country is awesome, they're going to say, I had a terrible time in that country. I'm never going back. Now, of course, you may not care about this, but like I said, things like that can have a much bigger impact on your life and your country than you may imagine. And I'm not saying that we should treat foreigners well just so they say good things about us. And I'm also not saying that we should treat foreigners better than we treat our own compatriots. Better than we treat people from our country. You know what I'm saying? Everyone should be treated with a decent level of kindness and respect, right? However, I'm just saying that I believe there's a huge opportunity in many countries for people to make a lot of money by providing a lot of value. That's all I'm trying to say. But what do you think? Leave me a comment below or shoot me a DM on Instagram and let me know what you think is missing from the tourism industry or simply what would make the industry better. All right. Now, in the next episode, I'm going to be talking about high school in the United States. I'm going to explain to you how the educational system works and what a typical day in an American high school is actually like. But that's it for now, my friends. So as always, thank you so much for your time and your attention. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode and learned a few things and got some ideas to consider. Um, But that's it for now. I'm going to get out of here, man. This is Life in English. I'm Tony Kaizen, and I'll talk to you later. Peace.